Yes, Mr. Keeley. My Lord's going to clause 8.2, which is in the supplemental bundle at divided one, and it begins at page 28. This clause follows upon what might be described as the standard BI cover contingent on the occurrence of physical loss or damage to the insured premises or other property, which one finds in 8.1. So 8.2, if one looks down it, uh, 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 as one would as a reasonable reader, one would identify that it's a combination of insuring clauses that provide substantive cover and a limited number of what might be described as quantification and administrative provisions. They're not all, as it were, cover extensions, uh, contrary to the impression given in the heading, which of course is a heading that cannot be deployed in aid of construction. And I'm just going to go through them very quickly because just to identify to your lordships what you're dealing with in terms of immediate context to 8.2.6. So 8.2.1 is what is colloquially described as AICW. ICW, increased cost of working, is a business interruption concept where the insured spends what is described as economic expenses with a view to reducing the business interruption loss. And the reason why they're described colloquially as economic expenses is because they actually do have the effect of reducing the business interruption loss. Uh, uh, for your reference, you don't have to look at it now, there is actually a definition of ICW, that's increased cost of working, uh, in uh, definition clause 1831, at page 71 of the bundle. Additional increased cost of working is for what are described as uneconomic costs. They are incurred by the insured reasonably and appropriately with a view to reducing the business interruption loss, but in fact they don't have that impact. They are nonetheless recoverable because they are reasonable and necessarily incurred for the purpose or the sole purpose of preventing or minimising a business interruption loss, in this case a reduction in turn. Uh, and there's a limit. So that is what I would describe, my lords, as an insuring clause, which is an additional insurance, which of course is nothing to do with damage or non-damage, it's simply there as an additional piece of indemnity. 8.2.2 you say it's nothing to do with damage, but it says incurred in consequence oh. of the damage. Uh, it, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, I'm so sorry, the costs have to be incurred. You're absolutely right, my lord. I'm, I'm, I'm taking it too fast. Um, it has to be incurred. They have to be incurred in consequence of the damage in order to reduce the loss. For, forgive me. Forgive me. Um, uh, 8.2.2 is uh, really... Uh, a quantification mechanics clause because that brings into account the monies received through alternative trading in order to reduce the business interruption loss. So if a restaurant burns down and the restaurateur goes and, li and, and rents other premises next door or wherever it is uh, in order to maintain his or its business um, and recovers or earns money that is to be brought into account in a net sense. 8.2.3 is what might be described as an insurance administration clause. It is basically reinstatement of the sum insured. So if you have a covered loss which reduces the amount of the indemnity available to you, you can, uh, 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 by paying an appropriate additional premium, you can recover the full sum of your insurance. In other words, you can recover the, you can return or reinstate the sum insured. 8.2.4, this covers BI loss 
caused by damage to contents and goods away from the insured premises or while in transit. The provisos, as we've discussed, to 8.1.1 are not applicable. Uh, for example, let's say you have beer uh, owned by the insured in a warehouse or being carried uh, from the warehouse to the restaurant and that's lost and damaged, uh, as a result of which business interruption loss is incurred at the restaurant, uh, that is um, uh, recoverable. So it doesn't have to be damaged to property um, at the restaurant, it's damaged to property owned or held in trust for the insured. Likewise, let's say you have an oven in a restaurant and it breaks down uh, 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 or, or uh, it breaks down or whatever it is, it needs to be serviced. So you send it off to be serviced or repaired and it's damaged whilst being serviced and so you don't get it back when you need to and so you can't restore your kitchen to full operation, then that is covered. 8.2.5 is fairly obvious. It requires damage to property in the vicinity of the premises, preventing the use of the premises or access to it. But it ex excludes utility suppliers. Uh, so, um, it, 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 for example, let's say there's a bridge uh, over which lots of customers travel to get to the restaurant and that collapses. Well, uh, and so there's a reduction in the number of uh, uh, customers as a result of the damage to the, to the bridge. Um, and uh, uh, so they don't come to the restaurant or they can't park near the restaurant and so they go elsewhere, then that is the type of loss that is covered. So there's damage to property outside the well, restaurant. Presumably your volcano example. My volcano example would work in that, in that situation. You're absolutely right, my lord. Um, uh, 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 that's absolutely right. Um, if there were, in this case, an explosion in the harbour in Sunderland, which um, uh, dissuaded people from coming or prevented them from coming to the restaurant, that would be um, something which would trigger the application of this clause. 8.2.6, I'll come back to that in a moment, if I may, but just pausing for a moment to uh, say something. It is in the middle of a sandwich of, as it were, layers of physical damage insuring clauses. You'll see that above it are physical damage insuring clauses and below it are physical damage insuring clauses. It is, as we put it, in lockstep with the rest. It is all of a piece with the rest. 8.2.7 is nothing to do with damage per se. It's in relation to reasonable charges payable by you to your professional accountants for producing basically details of the financial statements of the company or of the, of the business, um, such as might be required under 6.2.1 little e by insurers. That, my lords, is at page 60 of this bundle. It is a clause which you didn't, don't have to look it up at the moment. It's a clause which uh, says that um, the insurer may, in writing, uh, require you to provide us with such books of accounts and other business books, etc., as may reasonably be required by us for the purpose of investigating or verifying uh, your claim, etc. 8.2.8 8 .8 suppliers. This is in relation to damage at any premises of any of your direct suppliers. And so it too is a clause that requires physical damage this time to uh, uh, direct suppliers. Let's say the food, that's to say the raw produce at the restaurant's main supplier is destroyed by fire and so the insured doesn't get its uh, provisions and suffers a business interruption and a financial loss. That is recoverable. Then you have 8.2.9 which partly brings back into cover that which was excluded from 8.2.5 but only partly brings it back. We shall indemnify you in respect of interruption of or interference with the business caused by damage, etc., giving rise to damage to property at any generating station, uh, that's public electricity, public gas supply, public water supply, and public telecommunications undertaken. Now, um, in a sense, there's a certain degree of duplication here, because you see the words caused by damage as defined, etc., giving rise to damage to property. But that is it precisely the type of um, uh, 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 superfluity 
that any normal reader would understand as to what it actually means. It doesn't mean, as it were, double damage. It's just a superfluous reference. But in a sense, it's a superfluous reference, which, if anything, is supportive of my propositions because it requires double physical damage as opposed to single physical damage. But that is, my lord, um, infelicitous drafting, I accept. But there is uh, quite an important addition, and that's at the last two lines of this page. Because when the policy drafts person wants to include coverage, which does not depend upon physical damage to property, it looks as though the drafts person can achieve that readily. In addition, we will indemnify you in respect of interruption of or interference with the business caused by accidental failure of the terminal ends of electricity, supply of gas, supply of water, supply of telecommunications, provided, and there's a limit of £250,000, uh, or 15% uh, of the sum insured, whichever is the greater. Now, that does not depend upon physical damage. It depends upon the accidental failure of certain pieces of equipment. So when the drafts person wants to give non-physical damage cover, the drafts person can readily achieve that through the use of a fairly simple language, which indicates, by contrast, what the drafts person did not do, and therefore what the objective uh, meaning of the, of the contract is under 8.2.6. Then you have 8.2.10, which is unspecified customers. Um, this time, there has to be damage uh, there has to be interference caused by damage, as defined below, at the premises of any of the insured's customers, as subject to certain limited exclusion. Now, what, does that, what, what is that about? Well, let's say that the restaurant provides food and drink to the dining facilities at Sunderland Football Club. I don't know whether it does or it doesn't, but just assume it does. And the, the, uh, the dining facilities at the club burn down, with the result that suddenly uh, the restaurant is deprived of the custom of the club. Well, in those circumstances, if the restaurant is deprived of the custom of the club and suffers interference with its business, which that would constitute, then the insured can recover. Im imagine if, for example, the Pegasus uh, uh, bar, or whatever it's described as, at the Inner Temple, were uh, the beneficiary of this insurance, and, and, and King's Bench Walk were to burn down, with the result that no member of any of the chambers along King's Bench Walk came into the Inner Temple, and as a result, the Pegasus Bar, or restaurant, were deprived of custom. That would cover the Pegasus Bar in relation to the business interference uh, attributable to the destruction of King's Bench Walk. Then 8.2.11 is, uh, again, a uh, uh, it is quantification, it's VAT, 8.2.12. Well, it doesn't seem to apply, it might apply to the fat duck, but it doesn't seem to apply to normal restaurants. This is to do with the additional expenditure incurred as a result of damage insured under the uh, contents and building sections to property at the premises that interrupts the current research and development <coughs> programme of the business. And it tells you what uh, your cover is limited to. But it depends on damage. So there are nine, in all, nine insuring clauses in clause 8.2. Every one of them is either requiring damage expressly or will be parasitic on a damage claim. There is only one exception, which is the exception I identified, which is in the last paragraphs of 8.2.9. And the fact that damage is not required is a point made expressly by the language, accident, accidental failure of rather than damage to. Now, turning back to 8.2.6, Bellini says, at paragraph 35 of its skeleton, my learned friend has referred to this before, it's paragraph 35 of its skeleton, which is in core bundle, divider 3, at page 30, that the court must decide what the party's objective intentions were 
From the perspective of a reasonable SME owner, I should add, uh, as advised <coughs> by uh, intermediaries, expert intermediaries, brokers, at the time of the conclusion of the contract, not based upon, I think that must be, not based upon uh, uh, a minute textual analysis by a pedantic, legalistic, and unimaginative lawyer. Now, our reaction to that, my lords, is that I thought I was going to be criticised for not taking a minute textual analysis to the clauses, but actually doing the opposite, which is just looking at the clause with the eyes of a reasonable person, seeing the word in 8.2.6, uh, damage, twice, in emboldened type, seeing the context in which it appears, where every single other reference to damage in bold type means physical damage, physical damage to property. And I thought I was going to be accused of being rather oversimplistic um, and too impressionistic. Um, uh, I, I, as my Lord, Lord Justice Bales know, knows, I quite like impressionistic construction. Your Lordship found against me when I, I ran that one, um, your Lordship's impression being different from my impression. Um, but um, uh, uh, it, 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 taking putting that completely to one side, our approach can be described as simple. I don't think it should be described as simplistic. Our approach is an approach where we actually look at the words, see if there's a defined term which there is, apply the defined term in the context in which it appears, identify that actually it is unambiguous, and say that is the end of the story. Now, um, so we're not actually undertaking a minute textual analysis. Uh, we may be pedestrian, but not too pedantic. We're not legalistic. We're looking at the words in the ordinary way. And we're not wholly unimaginative, although um, perhaps we could be more imaginative. So uh, uh, we're looking at the clause. Uh, and we're saying, in fact, what the clause would mean not only to a conscientious reader, but dare I say it, to a careless reader. In other words, any reader. So there's nothing remotely hidden or remotely complicated. Now Bellini has now accepted in its skeleton that the requirement for damage on the face of it means physical damage. Uh, before the learned judge below, it said that what it meant was the effects of the peril, or the effects of the peril. That was a construction argument. I don't think it's making that any more. It accepts that the literal meaning of the words is to require physical damage. And my lords, it's against that background that one should look at Bellini's, what I describe as its new case on construction, because this argument about the wording or the language having gone um, obviously wrong, and there being an obvious error, was not one which raised its head before the learned judge below. It's essentially a new argument. Uh, uh, now, this is a forensic point, and therefore I apologise while I make it. One wonders about the clearness of the error, how obvious it is, when it appears that until the Court of Appeal no one has seen it for the obvious error that no doubt was manifested on the face of the document. Um, now that may be a legal point, it may be a forensic point, but it's not an irrelevant point. Um, one looks at the law and um, one looks at uh, my Lord's speech before the Canterbury University in Christchurch as one did over lunch, not having come across it previously, forgive me, uh, and one says immediately that if the words are unambiguous and clear, um, uh, 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 and looking at the authorities, then the courts have to give effect to those words, even if the bargain isn't the best bargain in the world for one of the parties. The, the scope of the obvious uh, error construction principle 
in other words, what has become fashionably known as the Chartbrook and Persimmon and Holmes principle, Lord Hoffman. That principle, as we know, has far greater antiquity. My Lord, the Master of the Rolls, referred to the case where one was looking at, I think it was the Bricklayer's Arms or something like that, uh, when it was the Waterman's something or other, something like that, and the error was obvious. In my respectful submission, one has to go really to uh, uh, the best repository to understand it without any sophistication, and I don't mean that rudely, is when one looks at Snell's Principles of Equity, as endorsed by Lord Justice Brightman, with whom Lord Justices Oliver and Lawton agree, in East and Pantile. And that, my lords, uh, we've uh, uh, put it in our skeleton, our skeleton argument, uh, which is in divider form, and it is uh, to be found at page uh, 51. Bundle divider for at page 51. This has been followed many times. One sees it approved by Lord Justice Ricks, Lord Justice Lewison, Lord Justice Anthony Clark, and others. And paragraph 41. In Snell's principle of equity, the principle of rectification by construction is said to apply only to obvious clerical blunders or grammatical mistakes. I agree with that approach. Perhaps it might be summarised by saying that the principle applies where a reader, with sufficient experience of the sort of document in issue, would inevitably say to himself, of course, X is a mistake for Y. And we refer at paragraph 42 to the judgment of Lord Justice Ricks in ING and Ros Rocker. And there's a passage in that judgment which I'm afraid we haven't highlighted. Uh, 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 no doubt that was an error on our part in the bundles. It is in the bundle of authorities at Divider 6, which begins at page 94. ING and Ros Rocker, your lordships may, be, um, uh, may have read this, it, it was a case where there was a dispute between ING, a bank, and a company, Ros Rocker, uh, and um, it, 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 in the contract there was an additional fee that was agreed to be paid, which was a ratio of the EBITDA for 2006. And the parties chose 2006 EBITDA because at the time uh, that they contracted, uh, they thought and expected that uh, that would be the 2006 EBITDA, would be the current EBITDA at the time of the transaction. In the event, the transaction did not complete until 2007. Using the 2007 EBITDA would have produced a materially lower additional fee payable to the bank. So Ross Rocker contended that the reference to 2006 was a mistake. Something had gone wrong with the language, it said. It should have referred to the EBITDA figure that was current at the time the transaction completed, which in practice became the 2007 EBITDA. The judge at first instance accepted that case, but the appeal was allowed. It was held that nothing had gone wrong with the language. The parties had intended for the relevant clause to refer to 2006. The mistake was not in the language, one looks at paragraph 24, I think one will find, that the mistake was not in the language, this is the judgment of Lord Justice Carnforth, nothing has gone wrong with the language as such. The reference to EBITDA 2006 was intentional. The mistake was not in the language, but in failing to anticipate its consequences. At paragraph 80, Lord Justice Ricks 
said at the bottom of that paragraph, that's at page 116, uh, letters D to E. At E, Ros Rocker wasn't obliged to close the deal. It could have raised the question of the appropriate former for renegotiation. However, these are errors of negotiation or commercial intuition, not errors of language in the expression of an agreement. In other words, you have an agreement and you fail to express it through an error of grammar or drafting. So you uh, send a notice, say as in Manai, and it refers to the 17th of, I think it was January, as opposed to the 18th, when everyone knew that it was intended to refer to the 18th. That is an error in drafting. Lord Justice Ricks gave further explanations at paragraph 110. And it's worth reading this um, in his conclusion. The fourth line. Construction cannot be pushed beyond its proper limits in pursuit of remedying what is perceived to be a flaw in the working of a contract. It's now clear in a less literal era that where a contract makes commercial nonsense on its own terms, it should be interpreted in a way which avoids the absurdity. And Tyos, which contains Lord Diplock's famous dictum, illustrates that well, for it concerned an arbitration award where the three arbitrators concluded that any other breach of this charter party in a time charter's withdrawal clause did not in context include any breach of any kind, but only any breach of a repudiatory kind. Uh, and the dictum, of course, is that of Lord uh, uh, Diplock, who said something like, if detailed and syntactical analysis of words in a commercial contract will lead to a conclusion that flouts business common sense, it must yield to business common sense. Uh, and then Lord Justice Ricks went on, in such a case, there is a choice to be made on the contractual language between an absurd interpretation and a commercial interpretation. And just pausing there, my lords, what we have here is unambiguous language in the defined term damage. So this is not where my learned friend is going. That's, I think, where uh, his learned junior went uh, before the judge below, and that is not, it seems, repeated before your lordships. Such cases are not uncommon. More rarely, something has indeed gone wrong with the language, and it is possible and indeed necessary to remedy the error, applying Lord Justice Brightman's and Lord Hoffman's two conditions. In such cases, however, the contractual language carries its own error within its own terms, as understood in context. As, for example, where there's been a misdescription specifying the wrong date, but the context of the document made the intended date obvious to anyone concerned. That's the Manai notice case, the case of contractual notice. More often, however, the contract will work perfectly sensibly in the context in which it's made, but it contains a flaw in that it doesn't provide for all eventualities. In such cases, the court may not be able to find a solution within the four walls of the contract itself. Moreover, there is a danger, frequently warned against in such cases, of the court seeking to remake contracts for the parties on the basis of what the courts consider would have been reasonable or more sensible for the contract to have said. Judges should not see in Chartbrook an open sesame for reconstructing the party's contract but an opportunity to remedy by construction a clear error of language which could not have been intended. And in our case, what your lordships do not have is, well, your lordships do not have either in our respectful submission an error of language or a clear error of language. The Chartbrook principle is very much not a recipe for correcting something that's gone wrong with the bargain, as opposed to the language in which the bargain has been expressed. Any reasonable person reading 
we'll see that it is not a non-damage disease clause. They would see immediately that it requires damage. And that would not lead to the inevitable conclusion that this must be a mistake in the language. Not in the context in which 8.2.6 appears, not in the context of a contract which is entirely consistent only with physical damage coverage unless the contract specifically carves out an extension or addition as we've seen in 8.2.9. Now the reader would conclude that like the majority of business interruption insurance, this is a typical damage requirement required insurance. The reader may say to itself, well, under 8.2.6, if I focus on that clause to the exclusion of everything else, may well say it doesn't seem to give very much cover. Now, it may be that the cover is limited. And we've looked at some of the examples that one can think of, which are actually not totally unrealistic, although, of course, I accept that they are limited. Um, my learned friend has alighted upon murder. Uh, 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 if you have damage at the premises as a result of murder, you're covered. If you don't have damages, uh, damage at the premises because of murder, you're not covered. But in our respectful submission, all that actually does is, uh, is be loyal to the clear delineation of the entire contract between damage cover, which is covered, and anything else, namely non-damage cover, which isn't. So you have some limited exceptions, loss of use, consequential upon physical damage. You see that in the liability covers, sections J and K, whatever they are. You see that. You see a limited extension in 8.2.9, but you don't see it elsewhere. Uh, in answer to your Lordship's question, where I said that, that you can't have a presumption of coverage even when the clause starts by saying, we will indemnify you against, I think I spoke too quickly, unthinkingly, as my learned friend would put it, unthinkingly and sloppily. Um, what I think the reaction would be to that would be an eyebrow would be raised and you'd ask yourself, is that what the parties mean? Because that's what the parties say. And you would conclude, well, that's what the parties mean because that's what the parties say. And so be it. That is an error in the bargain if there is a mistake. It's a mistake in not identifying the limited consequences of the bargain, but it's not an error in the expression of the bargain. You must be able to identify what the error is, and you must be able to identify it according to the legal principles. Uh, it, there must be one clear solution, a clear solution. It's not for the court to say, well, there are, um, we've got this problem, <clears throat> and there are another number of possible solutions, some of which are being proposed uh, uh, by one side and some of which are being proposed by another if you want to go down that route. Um, uh, uh, we have, at the moment, I think, something like three possible solutions. My learned friend proposes, I think as his primary solution, that one deletes the words damage as defined in clause 8.1. His fallback, as I understand it, is that one should uh, 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 refer to 8.1.4. The court has suggested there is possibly a third option, which is that the reference to 8.1 should instead be a reference to 18.16. And in our respectful uh, rhetorical question, how is the court supposed to decide between these three, no doubt, otherwise uh, 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 unexceptionable solutions? But it's a solution to what? Before, I'm so sorry. What, 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 um, just looking at it, being the cautious reader, reading this and listening carefully to what you've said, what, what, is, what is it that has to be damaged? 
damage. Uh, but there has to be uh, property damage. Well, which property? Because all the other clauses said what had to be damaged. This doesn't. Uh, and therefore, um, your lordship's absolutely right. There has to be damage. Uh, it has to be physical damage. So it has to be to okay. property. It has to be physical, physical damage. Physical damage to property. To anything at all. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Oh, no. It doesn't have to be property at the premises. It doesn't have to be property out of the premises. There has to be physical damage to a property. Um, for example, my example of the oysters. My learned friend says, let's say someone has an infectious disease 24 and a half miles away. Well, that person could well contaminate and thereby damage oysters 24 and a half miles. Careful about that. Doesn't that mean that if it was right that COVID was a fomite transmitting disease, it necessarily causes damage to something and therefore uh, we satisfy this clause? Oh, yes. Yes, there's no, there's no damage in this case. Oh, yes, no, this isn't. I, what I'm doing is giving your lordship an example of the application of this clause. Right. That, that's not what happened in this case, my lord. Right. What happened in this case was um, that there was COVID 19 yes. uh, in March 16th, 20th, 22nd of March. Um, uh, Boris Johnson. Uh, uh, right. Which I recall at that time, they still thought it was a very much transmitted disease. Oh, yes, yes, yes. But there's been no damage. There's be there have been cases within 25 miles of the restaurant, mm. but there's been no damage to property that has caused the business interruption um, in, in in this restaurant. Okay. Is it because the damage need not be to the premises that? Clause 826 is potentially, albeit in limited respects, wider than the basic cover in 8.1.1. Because I was wondering if you look at damage to the property, whether you could ever, ever have a claim under 8.2.6, which is not already covered under 8.1.1. But I suppose if the damage need not be to the property. That's absolutely right. It needn't be to the property at the premises. That's exactly the point. Yes, all right. Well, yes. Um, yes. Should have got there a while ago. No, 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 no. And in answer to my, my, my lord, I'm just about to say my own friend, in answer to my lord's uh, question, um, there's no uh, allegation that was damaged to a property outside the premises which was caused to the business interruption loss of the restaurant. Right. What, what's been alleged, my lord, if you, you ever look at the pleadings, is. Um, is um, what one might have found and did find in the FCA test case, essentially. In other words, there is insurance against business interruption loss caused by notifiable disease. There were uh, within 25 miles of the premises. There was notifiable disease within 25 miles of the premises. We can prove that. Um, uh, uh, because there were cases of COVID within 25 miles of the premises. <coughs> Those cases of COVID, in combination with all other cases of COVID in the country, caused the government to close down, to impose the lockdown. Every single case in the country was therefore a concurrent proximate cause of the loss. Ergo, we recover. No need for any physical damage to anything anywhere. And indeed, if your lordships do go to the pleadings, which is uh, uh, something that um, you will find in the bundle, in the supplemental bundle, I think, is it, or is it the court? Tab five of the supplemental bundle, the amended particulars of claim at page 97. Page 99, paragraph 11, factual background relating to the outbreak, closure as a result of advice guidance, restrictions, restrictions, meaning of outbreak means um, uh, 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 the national outbreak, if 
you go down to the antepenultimate line of paragraph 13, um, which therefore included the premises or within 25 mile radius. Alternatively, it is an occurrence at the premises uh, and relies upon manifestation. Uh, and then you have um, manifestation at D. Therefore, there was basically an outbreak. <coughs> and causation, um, no damage anywhere, physical damage anywhere relied on. And at causation under E21, test of causation set out by the FCA. And paragraph 24, as a result of the outbreak or occurrence of COVID-19 at the premises and or within 25 mile radius as pleaded above, along with other cases, a claimant of verse of UK government issued the guidance and or enacted legislation as set out in part C above, which amounted to interference and or interruption with the business. And if your lordships go to my learned friend Skeleton, for this case, in other words, it's bundle, uh, core bundle at um, divider three, at paragraph four, page 20, no reference to physical damage or to damage. Uh, 4A, the defendant provided Bellini with a policy. B, the cover covered losses arising from any human infectious or contagious disease manifested by any person at the premises or within 25 miles. COVID, which was a hu human infectious, etc., disease, was, as a matter of fact, manifested at the premises or within the radius. D, Bellini was closed by government intervention. E, the government intervention was caused by that manifestation. In current causes, F, the government intervention amounted to interruption or interference. G, Bellini suffered losses. So the way in which it's put against me is, as it were, predicated on this being a, a QBE, MS Amlin, Hiscox type non damage clause that one finds determined and decided upon by the Divisional Court and the Supreme Court in the FCA test case. And um, we say that what that actually manifests um, is that the case that's made against us is not um, that there was a mistake in draft or anything like that. It was a mistake as to the consequences of what was agreed. And, and one asks oneself, as in my respectful submission, one must, because one is in the area of grammatical or syntactic, well, not so much syntactical, it's grammatical or drafting error. What is it that the unthinking and sloppy drafts person actually do? What is it that that person did? Is it that they put into a non damage disease clause, the requirement of damage unthinkingly, all the while intending the cover to be non-damage cover, well, that's pretty almost impossible. Is it that they had a damage disease clause, such as we find in 8.2.6, and omitted to remove the requirement of damage from it unthinkingly, all the while intending the cover to be non-damage cover, in the middle of a section of the policy that makes it abundantly clear that all and virtually the only insurance under the BI was dependent on damage. Well, that's virtually impossible. And this is not an unimportant investigation because one of the key reasons, for example, in the cases in, I've taken Holding and Barnes, that was the case about the seven leases, five leases of parts of the building, two head leases. And what had happened is that um, the, the offensive, as it were, clause 4.3 in that case, was lifted from one of the five leases 
of only parts of the building or a building and dropped into the head lease, the Barclay lease. And, and it was obvious that that insertion was a mistake given its terms. If your logics need me to, I'll just take you to the case because it might illustrate the position. But the, in that case, it's um, holding in barns, my lord, uh, my lords rather. Uh, you, you will see it in the authority bundle. At tab four. Thank you. Your Lordships look at the head note. The appellant landlord, L, granted seven leases to the respondent tenant as part of the sale of the business. Two of the leases were of whole buildings in Barking and Ilford, Barking and Ilford leases. The other five leases were parts of buildings. T claimed L was in breach of its repairing obligations under the Barking lease, sought damages. The Barking lease had demised the whole of 17 Longbridge Road which it defined as property. T, that's the tenant, covenanted to keep the property in good internal repair. L covenanted by 4.3 to keep the foundations and the roof in good and tenantable repairing condition and to keep the structure and the exterior of the building other than those parts comprised in the property in good and tenantable repairing condition. Clause 4.3 of the Barking Lease was in the same terms as L's repairing covenants in the five leases of parts of buildings. It was different from L's repairing covenant in the other lease of a whole building, the Ilford lease, by which L covenanted to keep the foundations and the roof in good and tenable repair and condition, and to keep the structure and the exterior of the property in good and tenable repair and condition. It didn't have the parentheses that we've seen just above other than those parts comprising the property. Uh, and um, T contended, about four lines down, the words in brackets in clause four were so plainly wrong that they must have been included in error and should be treated as deleted, the second interpretation. And then it was held that the correct interpretation was the second one. The expression building in clause 4.3 must have the same meaning as property, since the demised property was entirely composed of the building and buildings. On that basis, the words in brackets in clause 4.3 made the second part of the provision nonsensical and workable. It was obvious that the parties intended clause 4.3 of the Barking Lease to be in the same terms as L's repairing covenant in the other lease of a whole building, the Ilford Lease. Instead, they had by mistake used the repairing covenant used in the leases of parts of the buildings, which made no sense in this context. A mistake in a written instrument can be correct as a matter of construction, where there is a clear mistake on the face of the instrument, and it's that clear that uh, that that correction ought to be made to cure the mistake. So, if you turn to page seventy-two, and you go to paragraph five, that's the Barking lease, and you see four point three, with those words in square in, in brackets just after building. Uh, and as the court held, those, bracket, those words in brackets essentially nullified the repair covenant in relation to the building because they meant exactly the same. By contrast, paragraph 6, 4.3 of the Ilford lease did not have those words in brackets. The other leases, which are of parts of the buildings, identified that the property was the ground floor office, and that was part of 2.3 being the building. The tenant's repairing covenant, which is in clause 3.3, is in identical terms to clause 3.4 in the Barking and Ilford leases, that is to keep the, the property in repair. The landlord's repairing covenant is in identical terms to the covenant in 4.3 of the Barking lease, and thus in different terms from 4.4 of the Ilford. And then 
if your lordship's uh, turn, one sees at paragraph 19, reference to Mr. Lord Justice Brighton's decision in Eastern Cantiles, and then the discussion at paragraph 22, the parties agree that the expression building in 4.3 of the Barclay lease must have the same meaning as property because the property is entirely composed of a building or buildings. On this basis, the clause can be rewritten as follows. To keep the foundations and roof in good and tenable repair and condition and to keep the structure and exterior of the property other than those parts comprised in the property in good and tenable repair and condition. And then you have paragraph 25. Clause 4.3 of the Barking Lease is not in the same form as Clause 4.4 of the Ilford Lease. Instead, the clause designed for the lease of parts of the buildings has been used in the Barking Lease where it makes no sense. Hence, the difficulty which the judge had has had in construing it and the necessity to read building as if it meant property. Once that change is made, it seems to me that the second of the three suggested interpretations is the correct one, applying the principle to which I have referred. Uh, and um, I I if you go to paragraph 29, it is explained a very different case. Very different case. Yes. It, it's, what's happened is that they've shown how much help you get. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, well, anyway. I'm so sorry. Well, w w all they did was they lift one provision yes. out of six leases and parachuted it into a lease where it made no sense. Uh, I'm so sorry. I, sh I shouldn't have laboured this point. But that is, um, forgive me, uh, uh, a clear error uh, in the drafting, not in uh, anything like making the bargain. It's an error in the expression of the agreement. So how does my own friend get over this problem? Well, very briefly, what he seems to be saying is that in clause 8.2.6, there is unity of purpose. And secondly, today he said, there is also the idea that one should avoid any stigma. But taking unity of purpose, what he says is that 8.2.6 is said to be dealing with situations that might occur on or near premises, which might cause national or local authorities to close down the premises, causing BI loss to the insured. Well, my lord, that is a bootstraps argument. It basically tells you what the objective meaning of the, contra of the clause is, and tells you because that's the objective meaning of the clause, Therefore, there must be an error in the language. But unlike all the FCA test case examples, or many of them, there is no insuring clause in respect of business interruption losses caused by notifiable disease upon the order of a national or local governmental authority. There just isn't any such insuring clause. What my learned friend has indulged in is reconstruction of a clause rather than its construction. And no amount of citation from the FCA will assist him. As your lordships have said, FCA was a completely different case where every single insuring clause was a non-damage insuring clause with the result the word damage had to be manipulated in the machinery of quantification clauses as a construct. The same in the Irish case of hypertrust. So the second way in which my learned friend puts it is to say that if we are right, then the cover in 8.2.6 is wholly illusory and pointless. Well, there's absolutely no rule, as I've indicated, my lords, or obligation that requires insurers to provide wide or wider cover than that which is actually provided. There is no rule or obligation that requires insurers to provide non-damage disease BI cover. I've given you some examples, my lord, of when 8.2.6 can apply. 
I accept that they are limited. But I've given you also the example of volcanic dust, and I've given you also that example in the context of your home insurance, and told your lordships that it's bad luck, as it were, that uh, if it were the case that you had to vacate your house, not because of damage to your house, but because of damage everywhere else. But that's, as it were, how the cookie crumbles, if that's the insurance you have. And there is nothing absurd about any of that. So, I accept that 8.2.6 is perfect, is not perfect. But then it's rare to find perfection in insurance contracts, even, dare I say it, uh, in the most perfect of repositories, uh, uh, according to the Supreme Court in some judgments of judges in the Court of Appeal. You don't have perfection everywhere. There are infelicities of language. But that doesn't mean that the meaning of 8.2.6 is not clear in its own terms. What your lordships have been invited to consider is what is, as we say, a lawyer's confection. It's an argument that was not advanced below. It's a late argument, and it's an unpromising basis on, to, uh, on which to run the appeal. It's also, my lords, an unpromising basis on which to end. And so I come to my, the end of my submission. Thank you very much, Mr. Keeley. Thank you, my lord. Lord, um, if I can briefly reply. Uh, first of all, my lord, the master of the rolls referred to the Britvic case. And um, I took the advantage of the, uh, the short adjournment to look at that case. Um, m m lord, of course, decided it if uh, the language is unambiguous, uh, the language must apply. Uh, with certain exceptions. The question is, how would a reasonable person with a background knowledge, how, how would that person have understood the language? And in paragraph 31 of that case, the Lord Has specifically Mr. Got it? said... Has Mr. Keeley got it? No. 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 Oh, I've got it now, my Lord. Have, um, have, uh, My Lord referred to it. Uh, it yes, no, no. My Lord I mean, specifically I said it. that case was not a case where there was sloppy or unclear drafting. What my Lord specifically said. And my Lord also said that, um, of course, my Lord, in my respect, submission, that's exactly the position in this case that is sloppy or unclear drafting. And my Lord then said, even then, i.e. in a case where there was no sloppy or unclear drafting, commercial considerations not to be ignored. Now we say it's an a fortiori, a, a fortiori in this case where there is sloppy and unclear drafting. And my learned friend, if I can um, refer to, he, he refers in, in his submissions to the judgment of Lord Justice Ritz in the uh, uh, ING and Rocker case, which is at um, tab 6, uh, page 94, and I think the passage my learned friend referred to was at page 110. And I think, with due respect, that bears some rereading, because he refers to the uh, judgment of Lord Diplock in, in the Antaios. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry it's, it's paragraph 110, not page 110. Uh, Lord, Lord, Lord Justice Ritz says construction is fourth 
lying down? Can it be pushed beyond its proper limit? The pursuit of remitting was perceived to be a flaw in the working of the contract. It is now clear in a less literal era that where a contract makes commercial nonsense on its own terms, in my submission, clause 8.26 is being made into a commercial nonsense, it should be interpreted in a way which avoids the absurdity. And Toyos, which contains all Jitrop's famous dictum at 201, illustrates that well, that well, for it concerned an arbitration word where three arbitrators conclude that any other breach of this charter party in the time charter withdrawal clause did not in context include any breach of any kind, but only a repudiatory breach. In such a case, there is a choice to be made on the contractual language between an absurd interpretation and a commercial interpretation. Such cases are not uncommon. More rarely, something has gone wrong with the language. It's possibly been necessary to remedy the error, uh, applying Lord Justice Bright Brightman's and Lord Hoffman's two conditions. And we so, so how is there to be a choice made on the language here? Well, because I mean, deleting, Lord, deleting words is not really a choice. Is it? Well, 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 my Lord, what, what, what there is with, with you in here is one, one does have a language which says, and it's, it's only in relation to uh, the, the, the covers in 8.2 or the different extensions which say we shall indemnify you in respect of uh, dot, dot, caused by damage as defined in clause 8.1. And one again finds that clause 8.1 doesn't define. Well, can, can you just answer the point that Mr. Keeley made, which is that as defined in clause 8.1 does not simply qualify damage but qualifies the whole of the foregoing words concerning business interruption. Well, be because cla clause 8.1 um, 8.11 says if there is damage to property used by you at the premise. I mean, what, what, what Mr. Keeley does is he, he looks at the first paragraph, 8.11, and, and, and he says, well, that's, that's a reference to that. Uh, let's not worry about the uh, provisos. He says, if there is damage to property used by you at the premises during the period of insurance, consequence the business carried on by you at the premises is, is interrupted and interfered with, then, then we'll pay in respect of each item of business interruption insurance saying the shutter, the amount of loss resulting from such interruption or interference. But uh, he, he, first of all, of course, wants to exclude the proviso. But, but, but that's, of course, part of 8.11. That, I, I, I think it's a slightly simpler point, to be honest. Nothing really to do with the provisos. It's simply that 8.26 says we shall indemnify you in respect of interruption or interference with the business caused by damage, as identified in clause 8.1. So what the 8.1 is talking about is the interruption of or interference with the business caused by damage, which is what 8.1 does refer to, subject to some provisos. Well, 8.1 uh, actually, my lord, refers to damage to property used by you at the premises. That's what 8.11 starts off with. With due respect, if one then uh, uh, seeks to apply that to some of the other covers, uh, denial of access, 8.25, which will indemnify in respect of interruption and interference with the business caused by damage as defined in 8.11, which is damage to property used by you at the premises, it makes no sense in relation to a denial of access cover, which is talking about damage to property away from the premises. It makes no sense to suppliers cover in 8.26, we shall indemnify you in respect of interruption of or interference with the business caused by damage at any premises of, of any of your direct suppliers, because that is providing cover where there's damage to the premises of the direct suppliers. Ex hypothesi, 
It's not damage to property used by you at your premise. But you, you yourself said that if, as an alternative fallback position, that if it was referring to anything, it was referring to 8.14. And in fact, it seems, anyway, arguably, to be referring to the whole of 8.1, which is a mechanism mm. uh, for uh, business interruption cover. It says so, business interruption coverage. And this is if there's damage to property used by you at the premises during the period of the insurance, and the premise business is interrupted or interfered with, we'll pay you this, and this is how you deal with gross profits, this is how you deal with gross fees, this is how you deal with gross revenues. Um, so it's referring to the whole gamut of 8.1, surely. Well, Lord. That, but that's not the not definition of damage, which is defined in 8.16.1 by the bolding. So, I mean, it just, what I'm asking you is what, why shouldn't that be a reasonable way of reading 8.2.6? Why does it really have to be a, a, a nonsense, as you say it is, caused by the fact that it only qualifies damage? Well, be, be, because uh, the, the, the effect of that is if you then say that, that Melanie Friend says at one time, I, I think towards the end of his submissions this afternoon, well, the infectious disease needs to cause damage. It needn't be damage at the premises. It could be damage anywhere, which is, with great respect, uh, a rather difficult, new and extraordinary point. So, so e effectively, he, 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 then, he, he then says, well, you, you, well we don't have you to know, decide he, that, he, do we? He, he's, got, he, he's got two sides of the coin. He says, you look at 8.21, because you need 8.21, he says before lunch, uh, to, to identify damage at the premises during the period of insurance. He now says after lunch, well, you can have 8.26, it can be property damage anywhere. It doesn't have to be at the premises. It doesn't matter to this case. That's a very interesting question that we'll leave for another court. Well, but, but, but it, it shows, in my respectful submission, the um, uh, flaws in my learning friend's argument. Uh, because uh, what, what, what one has but I mean, to I don't, I don't understand why, why it exposes the flaw in the point I was putting to you, which is the any question I asked, which is why should not, as defined in 8.1, refer to all the words before damage and not just damage? Well, if the point my Lord is uh, putting to me is, is 8.1 refers to the whole of 8.1, no, is that but, the point my Lord no, is putting No, the, the point, I'll, I'll make it as clear as I possibly can. The words in 8.26 are, we shall indemnify you in respect of interruption of or interference with the business caused by damage as defined in clause 8.1. Mr. Keeley's um, argument is that as defined in clause 8.1 qualifies interruption of or interference with the business caused by damage as, if, as sorry, just that the words interruption of or interference with the business caused by damage. And that's what is referred to. And if you look back at 8.1, it does indeed deal with interruption of or interference with bus the business caused by damage. So what's wrong with it? What's well, wrong, what, obviously what, what wrong? What we say, my lord, is, is that, th that there isn't a definition. No, I mean, I'm sure you understand the question I asked. It's not a question. The damage is defined in 8.16, but this is as defined in clause 8.1, which is the interruption of or interference with the business caused by damage. So in other words, it's well, no longer... 8.1 set, sets out... The, the 8.11 sets yes. out the basic coverage if there is damage, yeah. then the rest of it deals with, with the assessment of um, 
loss, depending on the way that loss is actually calculated. Or the interruption of or interference with the business caused by damage. Well, then, but, but my lord, then one has a situation where, 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 where there is coverage in 8.26 that cannot be coverage for some of these uh, provisions at all. So, That's for example, point. where is damage? I understand that point. That's a different point. I mean, okay, I've, I've asked the question. Well, Let's my lord, I, I, in, in my submission, uh, wh wh when it says, as defined by, as defined by in 8.26, it's effectively looking at, as defined by, it's referring to damage as defined by. It's not referring to, if one looks at 8.26, um, interruption or interference with the business caused by damage, it, it effectively referring to, to the whole thing. Right. It's referring to damage. Okay. So, and, and then, it, it, if I can take my law down on that, if, if, if my law says, well, that there has to be damage, we then come to a situation where 8.26, that there are covers there where um, there would be, would be no coverage. So, for example, if if one looks at 8.26, um, for example, E, closing a part of premises by order of the competent or for public authority, that's not going to cause physical damage. So that coverage is totally redundant. Learned friend seeks to say there would be coverage for infectious disease by espousing, uh, I don't know whether my lord M Maloney Friend is, is an expert espousing a theory that COVID-19 causes physical damage to property. That is a something which clients of mine in the United States have tried to argue in numerous states' courts with different... It's a very complex subject. And the idea that Maloney Friend just comes out with such uh, ex cathedra statements in this court with no evidence, no expert evidence. I'm only speaking for myself, but you won't find any reference to fomites in any judgment I'm likely to make. Well, so be it, my lord. But you see that that so so effectively to try and to try and say there is some coverage here, my learned friend then um, espouses a, a, a theory. But, but if we are not going to uh, 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 go down that no, rather what treacherous he, What he says line. is it doesn't matter if this provides additional cover. It may do because the damage can be to other things, but if it doesn't, it doesn't matter either. Well, it, 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 except it, if one then just looks at, it, um, for example, the other coverages, uh, 8.26, um, again, one again gets in as defined in clause 0.81. One again, in my submission, is looking at 8.1, and uh, one w w one goes to 8.1. It talks about damage to property used by you at the premises, which can make no sense in relation to those coverages. So, in in my submission. The, the way that this uh, insurance is drafted uh, makes no sense. And if one then looks at 8.26, um, the way that Maloney Friend is seeking to construe it is to denude the coverage of all uh, contents. So, And then, then the Lord says, uh, M M Maloney Friend says, uh, you, it refers to 8.1, uh, 
in order to make sure that that that's what he said before lunch uh, to make sure that uh, it's damage to property used by you at the premises and to refer to the period of insurance that's what he said before lunch but in my in my respectful submission that's no answer to the points we've made because clause 8.2.6 says we shall indemnify you in respect to interruption or interference with the business and the business is defined and it is a defined term at paragraph 1810 at page 69 of the policy and 1810 business means the business state in the church law and the, 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 the business stated in the schedule is a business ca carried on at a particular place, and one finds that at page 88 of this bundle. Which is precisely reflected in paragraph 8.1.1, which talks about damage to property used by you at the premises in consequence and in consequence, the business carried on by you at the premises is interrupted or interfered with, which mirrors precisely the words used in 8.2.6. Yes, but, but, but my lord, what, what I would say then is if one then does espouse that line, it, it makes no sense in, in relation to, to the other covers. Yeah, because I, the I, other I, covers I, don't, I don't, don't, don't cover... Uh, uh, property insured at, at the premises. Um, now, m m m Mr. Keeley then says that we are we are. It, it's quite frequent for there to be redundancy in an insurance policy or a commercial document. But we say that this isn't a case of redundancy. This is a case of absurdity. Because, as um, it's pointed out, you you read eight point two point six as providing coverage. We we will indemnify you, and when one examines what is provided, um, there is no indemnity, effectively, other than in the most extraordinary circumstances. That's not something which any rational uh, per person can um, contemplate. So M M Mr. Keeley then uh, gives, I mean, th 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 this may be part of his fomites point, but to try and show that there is some kind of coverage under this clause, gives the evidence of oysters contaminated um, 25 miles away, brought <coughs> into the premises. But, and, and the premises are then uh, closed down. Well, let's if the premises are closed down, it wouldn't be because of physical damage. And of course, it wouldn't be because the oysters were contaminated 25 miles away. It's because the oysters were contaminated in the premises. So uh, w w with all due respect, uh, that doesn't um, assist one. And and well, I, I dealt with the, 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 the point that Mr. Keeley makes that, uh, that, that there's something special uh, in relation to 8.2.6 because um, damage need not be. Um, physical uh, need not be damaged uh, at the premises or, or he, he, he says it could be damaged anywhere well my respectful submission is that really uh, is something which is quite surprising if I may say so um, uh, um, ca caused by damage as defined in clause point eight point one um, he 
I mean, I mean, the idea that, that this draftsman is drafting an insurance on the basis that an infectious disease might cause physical damage, or that murder and suicide might cause physical damage somewhere other than the premises, or that uh, injury or, or, or illness sustained by any person uh, might cause damage, really, uh, somewhere other than at the premises. Um, it's really extraordinary what, 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 what we are dealing with in our respect commission when, when we look at this is that the business is closed down because of these uh, misadventures, if I can put it that way, or that uh, clients fail to come to the business or there is a business interruption or reduction in business because of stigma arising from these perils. And, and in my submission, to, to try and say that, that this is a damage type of cover, um, I would submit really uh, um, is something which is not consistent with business common sense, uh, referring to Lord Diplock in, in, in the Antaios, and really is a case where uh, the um, arguments put forward lead to absurdity. Uh, and we would say that, that, that there is a clear mistake here. And we would say it is quite clear what the solution is, which is to um, read 8.2.6 as we should indemnify an effect of interruption or interference with the business arising from those uh, perils. And in those circumstances, if that is right, other references to damage refer to insured peril. Um, unless I can assist you further, my lords, but that, that is my submission. Thank you very much, Guda. <coughs> um, you don't want to come back on Brit, I think. No, my lord, it's very kind. Um, well, thank you all uh, for an interesting day. It will take time to consider our judgments, perhaps not given extempore straight away. And when you get the draft judgments, will you please remember not to use them for any other purpose than agreeing an order and costs. And if you can't do that, they will be argued about only in writing. And um, I'm sure that uh, uh, will be fairly straightforward. So thank you all very much, including your solicitors and junior counsel.